Hello and welcome to part two of this discussion on ways in, in which uh, microbial growth can be controlled. We looked at physical methods of control, chemical methods of control, some terminology, and now in this, this second part of this two-part series we'll look at the different types of disinfectants that are utilized in order to control growth. So phenol was, was, is a compound that's, that was first used by Joseph Lister um, in the 1800s and it was initially called carbolic acid, later changed to phenol. He used it to control um, infection at surgical sites and to prevent surgical wound infections. It did irritate the skin. Again, it's carbolic acid. That was the, the active ingredient, and he would make a solution out of it. He would dilute it and then uh, aerate it and spray it onto, onto the skin of the patient. It, it did irritate respiratory tracts a lot as well, and it stunk pretty badly. Um, but it was effective, and it did reduce the number of infections. Now, it wasn't, there was a lot of pushback against it because we didn't understand the germ theory of disease. We thought the, the prevailing idea of, of infection was the miasma theory, that we were breathing in some noxious gases or something in the air, and that's what was causing the infections, that it wasn't getting in through the surgical wound, but it was instead being breathed in, the miasma theory. And, and so it was not very well received because of the prevailing incorrect ideas about infection and how infection got into people. Um, but nevertheless, he continued to use it, he continued to promote it, um, but it was met with some resistance because of the, the uh, ignorant thinking of the day. Phenolics, next class of, of compounds that came out, uh, they contain phenol as well, but less stinky and less irritable. So they didn't irritate the respiratory tract as much, like Lysol, for example. Stable compounds that remain effective for long periods after application. And so they can be sprayed on a surface and just left. And then any microbes that fall onto the, the, um, the phenolic that's been sprayed on will die as a result of it. So it's a very effective disinfectant. And how do they function? Or, or what is their target plasma membranes? Which you'll see that's kind of the common trend here among these disinfectants. Uh, bisphenols are uh, the um, chemical compounds in those are hexachlorophene and triclosan. They disrupt plasma membranes as well. Um, triclosan is in like everything that we use in the bathroom or the kitchen. Uh, it's been determined, however, to be an inhibitor of estrogen sulfotransferase, which is an enzyme that regulates estrogen availability to the fetus. And so um, the estrogen is not becoming as available, and estrogen is utilized by the developing fe fetus, both males and females. We think of estrogen just being a female hormone. But during fetal development, it's necessary for 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 the, the fetus to develop into a human being. Uh, so it's needed by, by all of us. Um, if the estrogen is not available, then fetal development cannot proceed properly and some aspects of fetal development will, will, not, uh, will not proceed the way that they should. Um, so anyway, the, the issue with that is that this can be absorbed into a pregnant woman's bloodstream, then get passed on to the developing fetus and then interfere um, by inhibiting this enzyme estrogen sulfotransferase. Um, this was determined by a number of Japanese scientists in uh, the early 2000s. Biguanides, uh, chlorhexidine is the active ingredient in those. They disrupt plasma membranes as well. And when mixed with ethanol, it's very effective. So this would be what we would call a tincture. Uh, not tink like T-I-N-K like me, but T-I-N-C, T-U-R-E, a tincture. So you take a chemical compound and you combine it with an alcohol, you, typically ethanol. Ethanol becomes a solvent and then that chemical compound uh, mixed with the ethanol is very effective. Halogens, iodine, and chlorine, like the iodine that's in betadine, it's very, very effective. Dis it impairs protein synthesis, disrupts plasma membranes, and so it's causing problems at the ribosome. 
and also in the plasma membrane as well. The bleach, which would be the referring to the chlorine, it appears to disrupt membranes and denature enzymes and, um, and, and take care of that. So again, of course, that's that number one target, the plasma membrane and nailing the enzymes as well. So if the enzymes are shut down, they can't carry out their functions. Alcohols like ethanol or isopropanol, we call rubbing alcohol, they denature proteins. Water is needed though, and there needs to be water uh, with the alcohol. They will dissolve lipids, which of course is going to then disrupt membranes. Not effective when applied to wounds. Not only does it hurt, but it promotes a layer of protein coagulation from whatever the, the proteins that are in the blood under which bacteria can grow. So then you have this layer of protein above the bacteria that kind of like shields them or acts as an umbrella to the alcohol and then as a result of that the bacteria can grow without the negative effects of the alcohol and like I said before often used to enhance other disinfectants and we call that a tincture. Um, what you'll notice here in this table here on the right um, this is with the concentration of ethanol in different percentages at hundred percent <clears throat> that's there's no effectiveness and like I said there has to be water so if you reduce it down to 95 percent ethanol 5 percent water now you've got effectiveness across the board for the number the amount of time in seconds from 10 seconds to 50 seconds and this is against a particular pathogen streptococcus pyogenes which causes strep throat a gram positive bacterium 90 percent same thing the whole way down to 60 percent concentration so that would be 60 percent ethanol 40 percent water when you get below that when you have a 50 50 mix the time application has to be for a longer period of time uh, so uh, there there needs to be that amount and then you'll notice that 40 percent ethanol 60 percent water there's no effectiveness across this time scale that's given here um, so what we see in the in the supermarkets or the pharmacy, you'll see 70% isopropanol. They've upped it to 90% isopropanol. Um, but from what I can see, and now this is ethanol, but isopropanol, the same thing holds true. 70% concentration is just as effective as 90% concentration as well. So alcohols work really well because of their ability to... Um, take apart and dissolve lipids. Alcohols are, are nonpolar, lipids are nonpolar, like dissolves like, and so the nonpolar alcohols can dissolve the nonpolar lipids. Uh, we can use heavy metals, which not an 80s band, but metals from the periodic table, uh, silver, copper, mercury, zinc. Silver is the most effective, followed by copper, and a term that's applied to this is called oligodynamic action and they, they come from Greek words. Oleg means very little and dynamic we get the word like dynamite um, and so that means it's very effective. It's explosive. So a, a small amount is needed to be effective. What do they do? They denature proteins and it, it looks like and, and there's still more research that needs to be done on the exact mechanism of this but it looks like they attach themselves these ions these metal ions will bond themselves to ribosomes and then as a result ribosomes can't produce their proteins or they end up making proteins then that become denatured as a result of the the interference of these metal ions silver is sometimes combined with sulfa antibiotics which is very effective for treating burns it's called silver sulfadiazine um, you see the tooth filling, so we use metals in our tooth filling, mercury being one of them. You can buy band-aids with silver infused into the pads. And then the one on the right, terrible picture, but it's supposed to show coins on a lawn of bacteria that are on those, that petri plate, and the coins will inhibit their growth somewhat. Um, you, there, we use oligodynamic action in paints, for example. We use fungicides in our paints so that we don't get mold and mildew growing on our walls, especially in bathrooms, for example. You can buy clothing with silver infused in them, like clothing in which you, typically you get stink, like socks, for example. You can get socks with silver nanoparticles or silver nano threads woven into the fabric, and that silver will bond with the fungi to reduce, say, um, athlete's foot, or will uh, prevent stink from bacteria that are growing in the moist, warm 
uh, environment of your of your shoe. Other ones, uh, uh, surface active agents or surfactants, what we would uh, soap would be classified as one of these. They decrease surface tension among molecules and and because of their and the couple other ones that I mentioned here because they have charge on them. Gram-negative bacteria are generally more resistant to soaps and detergents than gram-positive. Again, because of their complex outer membrane. So soaps, how do they how do they take care of us? How are they working? It's mechanical removing of the microbes. They're degerming agents. They're not a sanitizer, so they're not killing them. But what soaps do is they kind of package up the dirt that carries the bacteria into bubbles and so you, you lather it up and then you rinse your hands off and that water will just carry all of that off and send it down the drain. Um, some soaps can be more effective because of the they have chemical compounds incorporated into them. So for example, Dial Soap does, and it's very effective. And I've tested this a number of times in my micro lab with my students. Uh, how effective is Dial Soap compared to other soaps and other disinfectants? And it, it does extremely well. Uh, it's, a, it's a very good antimicrobial uh, soap. So it's got the antimicrobial compound in it, along with the benefit of being a soap, where it's decreasing surface tension, packaging up the dirt and the grime and the bacteria into these bubbles, and then gets rinsed off the skin. Acid anionic detergents, they actually sanitize. They kill because they disrupt the plasma membrane. Um, so these are ones that are negatively charged. They are um, they have a charge to them and so they get attracted to different regions of the bacterial cell wall. These detergents you would find in mainly shampoos like sodium laurel, laurel sulfate or ammonium laurel sulfate. So these work really well at breaking down sebum and getting rid of the dirt and the grime that's in your hair. But at the same time, if it's used too often, um, because they are ions, they create negative charges that, that are um, they get attracted to your hair shafts and then the, it repels the hair shafts and then it leads to frizzy hair and and hair that just is unruly which is I, I have to deal with that every day I'm so concerned about my hair uh, not really um, so that's the way these detergents function really good at removing the dirt and the grime but then can also lead if your hair is 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 of a particular nature or style it can lead to frizzy hair and and uh, then you have to put more product in it and who wants to do that anyway I digress so quaternary ammonium compounds they're called quats and cationic or positively charged detergents so they kill bacteria they they kill fungi they denature proteins by doing that they disrupt plasma membrane and they're used in a number of products so they're the most widely used surfactant um, that's on the on th that's in production today and in so many different applications they're very effective in in a number of different ways and that's what makes them so useful and and uh, so abundant we have chemical food preservatives organic acids or carbon-based acids that are generally harmless to the body they inhibit microbial metabolism and some that you might see on a label for example of, of food that you buy at the store sorbic acid benzoic acid calcium propionate which is an acid as well. Uh, they control molds and bacteria in foods and cosmetics. Cosmetics have a lot of animal fats in them to make them sticky like lipstick or mascara uh, and so they are susceptible to uh, bacterial contamination and so these these acids then can be used in these ways to reduce the amount of microbes that grow in these products. Nitrite prevents botulism endospore germination used a lot in meat products um, and antibiotics, uh, nicin, which is antibacterial, and natamycin, which is an antifungal, prevent spoilage of cheese. So we use ant these actual products from living things that they produce, and we use them as antibiotics in our food products as well. Aldehydes are some of the most effective antimicrobials. They inactivate proteins by cross-linking with functional groups. What that means is it basically changes the shape of the protein and it, it renders the protein useless because it's linking it's cross-linking functional groups when it shouldn't be and so now the protein becomes denatured in some way or chemically altered and so now it can't perform its function 
formaldehyde or formalin is used to preserve biological specimens like dissecting frogs, for example. Uh, I have some frogs in my lab at school that are probably uh, two th so they're about 20 years old and still able to be used as dissection specimens. Gluteraldehyde is used to disinfect hospital instruments. It's more effective than formaldehyde. And both of these aldehydes are used by morticians for embalming uh, people. So very good. Antimicrobials, that's why I can have frogs in buckets 20, that are 20 years old that haven't been broken down by bacteria. They're not rotting at all. They're just in swimming around in, in formaldehyde. Gaseous sterilants. So these are in a gaseous form rather than a liquid form that we are typically accustomed to spraying a liquid on or something like that. They're in a gas form so that they can get into everywhere, every nook and cranny uh, used for equipment that can't be submerged or can't have any kind of solution on it, which would ruin the piece of equipment. Um, they're very effective. They denature proteins and they may be carcinogenic, so it looks like it, some of them may cause cancer. Not sure yet. Ethylene oxide is, is a common gaseous sterilant that kills all microbes and endospores. Takes a while to do it, but it will lead to complete sterilization. And the key is that it kills endospores. There are so many disinfectants that can do nothing against endospores, but ethylene oxide can. Used to sterilize hospital equipment and spacecraft, and we call that planetary protection. We do not want any of our microbes leaving Earth and getting into outer space. So anything that goes into outer space is uh, has to be sterilized before it leaves Earth. Peroxygens are oxidizing agents. So they are agents that, remember, Leo the lion goes grr, lose electrons oxidation. So these are oxidizing agents that are involved in that. Uh, ozone is used with chlorine to disinfect water. Hydrogen peroxide, not effective on open wounds because of catalase, which is an enzyme that breaks down hydrogen peroxide immediately into water and oxygen, but it is effective on inanimate objects. Benzoyl peroxide is effective against anaerobic microbes, such as those that cause acne, so you see that as an active ingredient in, in many uh, anti-acne solutions or creams. Parasitic acid, one of the most effective disinfectants available, used in food processing and medical industries. So these guys are... Um, taking electrons, moving them around, and uh, causing the microbes then to uh, not be able to reproduce, or it will denature proteins within them, or disrupt uh, ribosomal function in some way. Um, and so this is how these guys are working, and interfering with the chemical compounds that these microbes are actually producing within inside uh, their cells. And this one just shows the from the most resistant to the least resistant microbes. Now you look at the top, most resistant is a prion. A prion isn't even a microbe at all. It's, a, it's an infectious protein that uh, is, they're, they're lethal diseases. They are 100% lethal. There is no treatment for a prion disease and there's no cure. But in terms of what we're talking about, and we'll talk about prions later, but in terms of disinfectants, disinfectants can do nothing against prions. They even um, can, quote, survive an autoclave. They don't denature, and so they are infectious as well. So when an individual develops a prion disease, what happens is these normal cellular proteins get transformed into these... Um, what I want to say, these infectious prion proteins, which then impair cell function and leads to cell death. And they spread, they're infectious, so they will move through the infected individual from one cell to another, and they, they, they transform the normal cellular proteins into these prion proteins. Um, and they're devastating diseases. They are resistant to just about everything. There's, there's very few things that, that we have available to us that can actually destroy prions. We have no treatment for it. So once you develop a prion disease, um, it's, it's the end. It would be a death sentence, at least at this point in time. Um, and then we go down endospores, the whole way down to the least resistant, viruses with lipid envelopes. Those ones are the least resistant because they have that lipid envelope. So I mentioned 
maybe I didn't mention this in another chapter, but I will when we get to viruses later. Um, viruses, you'll notice if you go up a couple spots there, vir viruses without an envelope, they are more resistant than viruses with an envelope. And you think, well, it's got a lipid envelope. It's got an extra layer of, of, of protection. Well, no, it doesn't. That lipid envelope, because it's so simple and lipids are so easy to break down and, and break apart with disinfectants, um, they become very susceptible. So if they have a lipid envelope, they have to have the lipid envelope. Without it, they're done. So the viruses without the envelopes, they're a little more resistant because they're, they have a capsid, which is a protein that surrounds them, and capsids are more difficult to deal with and break down than lipids are. Um, SARS-CoV-2, the coronavirus, it's a virus with a lipid envelope, and that's why so many uh, healthcare professionals and scientists recommend hand washing, hand washing, hand washing for at least 20 seconds because coronavirus has a lipid envelope and soaps can break down plasma membranes. Plasma membranes are made mostly of lipids, and so if soaps are good against plasma membranes for breaking down lipids, then hey, they're going to be effective against viruses with lipid envelopes as well. So that makes them the least resistant. Why do they have a lipid envelope? Um, it, it gives them easier entry into host cells. So having a lipid envelope is good for that, but it comes at a cost. It makes them uh, less resistant to our arsenal. So that's it for this chapter. This is Chapter 7, Control of Microbial Growth, just a two-part lecture. Uh, hope you enjoyed that lecture, which I'm sure you did, and thank you for watching.